Hi, I'm Cami. I'm codependent. Um, I'm going to be talking about step 10 today. Uh, and step 10 is continue to take personal inventory. And when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. And in that step, sorry, my cat's trying to eat the dog food out the bag next to me. In that step, um, I've circled the word continued to take personal inventory. Uh, and I've also circled the word personal. And when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. So I've circled promptly as well. And the reason I've done that is because the word continued means that working the 10th step is a continual process. It's something that I do every single day. Um, so it will usually be once I've had dinner and the kids have kind of mostly quietened down. I'll sit down with my journal and I'll write down, um, I'll write down some questions. And some of those questions can be things like, what was I grateful for today? What did I need to accept today? Did I pray? Did I meditate? Did I do some form of coda reading or spiritual reading? Did I exercise? That one is usually a no. Um, I need to be better at that one. Did I do outreach and did I give service? Um, and then I work through those. And also with personal inventory, I try not to take inventory of other people in my day. I try to keep it to myself and what my actions were and how I may have contributed to my day. And if there's anything in that personal inventory, then I need to take responsibility for it quickly and admit it. So the first person I would admit that to is myself. Um, I need to admit it to myself before I can admit it to anybody else. And usually that then follows with meditation with my higher power. What's happened, you know, do I need to make an amends? Is this something that I need to consult my sponsor or co-sponsor or fellowship friends with? Somebody who has maybe a bit more recovery in that area than I do? Or just sometimes just to bounce it around with, with people in recovery just to see, um, is that something that I need to make amends for? Or sometimes I just don't know. Um, so it's good to ask for feedback. And um, if I do need to make amends, it's the question of, is it a direct amends? Is it a living amends? Is it an amends to me? Is it amends to somebody else? Um, and if so, then it's a question of step fouring it. So taking it from... Um, <laughs> sorry no taking it from step 10 to step four so if I've done something wrong that day or something that's uh in my defects I can take it and step for it and look at why I did it what triggered it um how I resolved it what I can do next time that's different and just really focus in on learning from an experience that wasn't very comfortable um there are other questions that I asked myself I can ask myself if I was honest with myself today is there anything that I can celebrate because it's not always the amends that I need to recognize it's the good stuff too um how was my serenity today did I lose it what was my part in it? Have I had connection to my higher power today? Um, did fear prevent me from doing anything that I wanted to do? Do I owe anybody an apology? And is there something that I'm keeping to myself that I need to talk to other people about? Um, so step 10 is a really important one for me, in my opinion, because it keeps me on the right path it keeps me thinking about where my recovery is and um, 
and it keeps me responsible for my actions and my words, but it also keeps me humble in my recovery. Um, my mind's gone blank. <laughs> so, yeah, so just every day writing it down in my journal, making sure that I'm accountable for my actions seeing where I can make a difference um, and that's it really. Um, can I get a time check? Yes, you have, um, let's see, about uh, 35 minutes. 35 minutes. Well, until the top of the hour. Okay. Um, okay. So I guess then I have more time than I thought I would have. So <laughs> I can go back a little bit and talk about my journey in CODA, I guess. Uh, so I came to CODA in the end of August last year. And it was after a string of really bad relationships. Um, and I came here on advice from a uh, therapist. And Sorry, my head is blank. <laughs> Can you pause recording for a second and just give me a moment? Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, recovery is not always easy. And sometimes, as you can tell, my anxiety gets the better of me. And that's still because I'm a work in progress and because... I'm not perfect and even though I've worked my 12 steps and I would like to think that I've got it all together a lot of the times I don't have it together and that's okay because there's something that I'm going to learn in that and I think before CODA that moment just now where I just froze and my brain stopped working um, I probably would have come away from here in tears and just absolutely beating the shit out of myself. Um, and now I don't have to do that. I can say, okay, um, yeah, I had a moment and that's fine. I'm okay now. Um, so I'll continue. Um, there was something that happened to me this week that I wanted to talk about. Before recovery, I almost went into a really bad relationship with this man who was very unboundaried. And quite verbally abusive and this week he contacted me on whatsapp and I thought okay I want to see what he's like now from the other side of recovery now that I've done these steps and I've got a bit of recovery um so I invited him over for lunch and the second that he walked into my house, he was already being verbally abusive. He was making fun of the way my house was. And I'm a single mom with three children. My house is never going to be spotless, at least not for the next 10 years. So, you know, it doesn't really bother me what people think. I've got, I've got two dogs and four cats as well. So yeah, it's just, it's never going to be spotless. Um, and he was just picking at everything. And I've recently bought myself a bike as my way of self-care so that I can go out and ride my bike in the forest and just be more connected to my higher power. And he came in and he was laughing about the fact that I have a bike and like, oh, I can't see you on a bike. Oh, it looks stupid. Da, 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 da. And it was just really mean. Um, and I sat there this time from a place of recovery and I realized, um, wow, you know, like, why did I even like this guy to begin with? And I think what it is, is before CODA, I was clinging to people to have a relationship because I was so afraid to be on my own and have to be with myself and face myself and 
I didn't want to be on my own with the kids and I needed somebody there to take care of me. And now I can kind of do it for myself and I don't need that. I don't need to cling on to people. Um, so from a place of recovery, it was, it was almost a really surreal experience. It was like, wow, you know, a year ago, I would have been in a relationship with him. I would have moved in with him. I probably would have married him, uh, <laughs> had his babies and everything. And he's just absolutely nasty. Um, and there was a few things that he said, you know, that made me think he wanted to know what I wanted for lunch. And I didn't know, I wasn't very hungry. It was like nine o'clock in the morning. And he was like, I need to know what you want for lunch. And I said, I really don't know yet. And he's like, no, I have to know what you want for lunch. And I was like, it's a bit weird. Like, why do you need to know what I want for lunch? You know, he's like, so I said, why do you need to know? He's like, I just want to know. And I was like, okay, yeah. It's just red flags everywhere. Um, so now, I mean, there was hardly any conversation. It was just really forced and when he left my house I was just kind of like oh thank god you know thank god I didn't follow that one through because we just don't have anything and all it was was me trying to please him before and it never would have worked because nothing was ever good enough and then I was also thinking about the friendships that I have through CODA uh, from that Monday mixed online meeting um, that we have I've made some really really lovely friendships and I didn't have any friendships before CODA I had one good friend and it was only a friendship of necessity it was when she needed something she was calling me because she knew that I was gonna I was gonna jump you know it'd be like three o'clock in the morning and she's like Candy help me I'm like, okay I'm on my way and that's it. I'm in my car and I'm driving to her house at three o'clock in the morning because she's having another drama. Um, and once I stopped being codependent with her and I started to put my boundaries in, she faded off. She didn't want anything to do with me anymore because I wasn't doing anything for her anymore. And now I've got these really lovely friends in CODA um, and it's friendships of honesty and sincerity and People who are my friend because they genuinely want to be my friend, not because there's something I can give them. And they are the most lovely people in the whole world. And one of my friends said to me, I can't remember if it was yesterday or the day before now, um, I think a year ago, you didn't have any of those people as your friends. And it really hurt. It really, I really sat there and thought about it. And for a minute, my heart was breaking because I was thinking I never had them a year ago. And I was thinking back to the person I was a year ago and I was well over a year ago now. I was like this shell person just doing everything for everybody else and kind of just bobbing along through life with nothing. And now because of CODA, I've got all of these wonderful things and I've got all this lovely recovery and these lovely friends and can see a few people here from the Monday online mixed. And um, it's lovely just to see faces that I recognize and people who I would class as really good friends. So yeah, there's a lot of recovery in CODA and a lot of really good things to come from it but I've also got a long way to go and this meeting has definitely shown me that <laughs> um and it just reminds me that I'm not perfect um but the fact is you know I buggered it a bit at the beginning but I've carried on I've not run away and hid and I'm still here and I'm still talking and some of you might be thinking, holy crap, I wish you'd shut up, but I, you know, I'm still here. Um, and that's all I can do. I can just keep going and keep working it and hoping that it's good enough. Um, and hoping that one day I'll sit on a long chair and not fudge it um, and be able to speak without feeling like 
an idiot or um an imposter because sometimes I think when people ask me to do shares I think why are they asking me I don't I don't have enough recovery or you know there's loads of people in Coda who are better than me like why ask me um so yeah I'm grateful to be here I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to share I hope that my share has given something at least um I'm sorry I buggered it in the beginning. Um, I've probably got a thousand minutes of my share left. <laughs> but this is a really wonderful meeting. So thank you for letting me come and thank you for letting me share. And if you've got questions, I can answer them for the rest of the time that I've got. Um, it's all yours. Thank you. And thanks everyone. I. I Thanks for it. Well, thanks for inviting me and stuff um, over to your part of the world. I mean, <clears throat> I'm not sure how I can quite kind of make it after a, a video like that from um, Lady Gaga, but I will do my best. <clears throat> Certainly no Gaga moves, but I will do my best to kind of talk about my experience in, in Coda and strength and hope, I suppose. So, yeah, I'm Paul. I'm codependent. Um, I, I've actually never done a, a sort of chair or share on a specific step, even though I've, I've actually been in code 10 years. So quite a, quite a while, but <clears throat> I haven't. And when I only found out yesterday, it was like, oh, you kind of really, it'd be good if you could share on sort of step 10 type thing. And so I just, it made me think about it. And actually it was really, ha it was really good for me that I um, was asked to do that actually. So <clears throat> for me, I think step 10, <clears throat> I would say it challenges for me my greatest and for me my most prominent and sometimes troublesome, most troublesome sort of belief about myself. And that's that I have to be perfect. Um, especially for me that I'm now in long-term recovery, it kind of adds an extra pressure on myself that I, I put on myself and others put on. Um, I actually used to be really frightened of this step. I really thought it meant I had to perform kind of a, a critical judgment inventory of myself every day, um, fearlessly searching out and focusing on my bad points, my defects and what I was doing wrong. I actually now call them, and I have done for a while, character defenses rather than defects because def defected is actually a label I carry around from birth. Um, and it's something I don't want to label myself anymore. So I actually think they're defenses that I've created over my lifetime that, <clears throat> that are my things. Um, for me, step 10, it's a, I would say it's a tool that allows me to continue to be aware of myself. But actually, for me, in a nurturing and accepting way, instead of focusing on others, <clears throat> step 10 gives me permission to identify my behaviours um, or my feelings and, and release them with love. Ultimately, I would say this step gives me freedom <clears throat> or type of freedom. It allows me to look at things I've done well instead of focusing on negative, because for me, a kind of default place can be focusing on the negative, but actually it's taught me how to review my day or my week or whatever period it is, and actually sort of focus on more of the, neg more of the positive things, or at least see them <clears throat> now, not actually focus, but see them. I think for me before recovery, I would say I was an expert at staying focused on externals, anything external, anything outside of me, what others were doing, what they weren't doing, what others were trying to do to me, what they had done to me, <clears throat> and also how much better I would feel if they would do something differently. It was all about external, all about other people's behaviours. And I think this thinking that, 
others were somehow in control of my life <clears throat> path and that they could make me feel better or different. It was just an illusion. Um, and I learned the hard way that it was an illusion by hitting my rock bottom due to codependency. And that was 10 years ago. I think the words <clears throat> that I use in step 10, which is probably my most, the most common for me, is that I was wrong and I'm sorry. And I think they're such powerful words. And to be honest, just, just saying I was wrong and I'm sorry, it's usually healing enough. I don't normally go need to go into more detail than that. And I don't actually feel that more detail often is helpful. I feel that almost I can sort of over manipulate by using lots of detail, whereas just a very simple, I was wrong and I'm sorry. I think it's very powerful. For me, I do hear some friends <clears throat> in other fellowships talk about their experience in step 10. And it seems to be what I hear, and it could be just the way they're describing it or what I'm wanting to hear, or I don't, I don't know, but I hear about it really a lot about making amends to other people. Whereas for me nowadays, particularly, I really see that I need to be top of the list of my amends not other people um it allows me to say sorry to paul really for the stuff i've done to myself <clears throat> not to other people or not other people have done to me me to me <clears throat> and that's actually really important because that takes me more in myself and not all about my codependent self which is all about the everything else in the world <clears throat> people places and things in the world not me and it sort of i'd say it, it grounds me it sort of brings me back into being me <clears throat> um step 10 for me isn't something i do daily necessarily it's not like a a specific thing and i've worked quite hard actually to to let go of it being i have to do it at 9 p.m or i have to do it at 7 a.m or otherwise my day isn't right or i haven't done it perfectly again it's this perfectionism thing that i spoke about at the beginning I kind of, I intertwine it with like, I can just sort of sometimes just think it. I can just consider how have I been behaving? Is there anyone I need to sort of say sorry to or apologize? Is there something I need to, you know, kind of make right? If, or not necessarily, I can't necessarily make it right, but can I, do I need to kind of try to reset anything, say sorry, whatever it might be. And But I don't do it like as a strict, daily thing or a written thing exactly I kind of I feel like I kind of just live it most of the time there are occasions where I will write something down but it's not like a set thing for me that sort of just doesn't actually work for me um I kind of need that fluidity and it, it seems to work for me to be honest um <coughs> for me that's probably it on step 10 I know probably like um, I saw with uh, uh, Camille, there's, I've probably got like 70,000 minutes left because I was actually ex expecting to speak for like 15 minutes or something. Um, so I, I maybe I could just talk about my coded journey and experience strength and hope perhaps. And maybe some in that might step 10 stuff might be in it. And maybe there might be stuff in there that might resonate. I, I hope that's okay with everyone. Um, so yeah, I, I, like I said at the beginning, I came into Coda 10 and a half years ago for me, proper rock bottom. <clears throat> I hadn't been in another fellowship before and I don't have, or so far, I don't have addiction to substances or alcohol. Um, I have process addictions. So people, um, I'm in three fellowships, two of them related to people and relationships and like love addiction and stuff. Um, and I'm in another fellowship to do with um, money. <coughs> um, <coughs> well, it's kind of to do with money, but really it's about the emotions. But um, obviously, yeah, anyway. Um, so, yeah, I came in having actually gone into a treatment centre, a 28-day treatment centre in the UK for codependency, <clears throat> which was not so common. Well, not, not, well, it wasn't so common like 10 years ago. It was kind of, you know, it just wasn't. Um, however, I was fortunate that I went to a place where they, anyway, they kind of, they did deal with that sort of stuff. 
So I ended up there because my world, for me, my foundations that were very, my scaffolding that was like clearly very um, shaky was really starting to fall apart. <clears throat> and this is like the control for me is a big part of my codependency. Um, and I could feel I was losing that. And I was losing it because I was finally going to get found out for kind of the, the stuff I was doing really for me related to codependency and kind of love addiction, but codependency was coming to a head, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> so ultimately for me, it was, I was, I knew I could tell I was about to get found out that I ended up actually stealing quite a lot of money from my employer. And it wasn't for money's sake and it wasn't for kind of um, anger about my employer or anything like that. It was actually a codependency on my wife <clears throat> for me. My wife is a spending addict and at that time particularly was significantly in debt. And actually it wasn't, it was partly about compulsively helping her. But actually, it was more my innate fear that I've had from my youngest memories of being alone. <clears throat> and my fear of losing the marriage and relationship was so great that I went to any lengths to try and not lose it. But I didn't consider that I had two young children at the time. And I didn't consider that what I was doing was really high risk. It's illegal. You know, it's against the law in... I, probably every country I don't know but certainly against the law here and I didn't consider the sort of consequences of my actions so typical addict type behavior of doing something that you know is pretty serious really for someone else not even for me well kind of for someone else and not considering the consequences of my actions so anyway I kind of my rock bottom was that I lost my job that I'd been in a long time and for me, work addiction and kind of um, uh, um, sense of self around my job <clears throat> has always been a very big thing. Getting my steam from my position and my job was a big thing. So <clears throat> I lost that while I was in there. Got, I had to resign because I got found out. I lost my home because I the money situation and everything. So I kind of I lost these things that to me at the time were me. I didn't know me. I didn't know the human me, the spiritual me, the kind of emotional me. So it was the it was the physical things in life that actually at that time were kind of I defined as me. So for me, that was it was a big loss. So I ended up, yeah, I ended up there and kind of, yeah, in a in really not a good good place at all. Kind of self harming and wanting wanting to die, but not actually dying but I was self-harming so it was it was pretty serious severe times and that was codependency for me it wasn't a drug issue of my own it wasn't alcohol it wasn't actually gambling I wasn't kind of it was a desperation to not be alone and that for me comes from my youngest memories of childhood of being in a big family of five I'm the youngest of five kids I've got four elder sisters my dad was a workaholic had his own business my mum was an absolute love addict and basically just chased after my dad. So she actually ended up working for my dad just to kind of, one, be with him all the time, I think, and two, my dad would have affairs. All secrets in the family, like a lot of people I hear about, you know, all secret stuff, but it was never that secret because I kind of knew at a very young age. So my mum was not available. My dad wasn't available. He was a workaholic. <clears throat> um, so I grew up with one, no boundaries, I could do whatever I liked, which when I was quite young, I quite liked. I could come home at midnight or whatever time I wanted. I could go out, I could do anything because there was no one really watching or kind of, there was no one really. They weren't, they weren't physically there for me. <clears throat> and that boundary thing has really followed me into my adult life in not a good way because I didn't understand, I didn't appreciate particularly other people's boundaries. Um, all sorts of, you know, physical boundaries, emotional boundaries, time boundaries, all that stuff. I had no concept of it. I really didn't. And I've had to really reparent and learn that stuff. It's really hard. 
So I grew up in this big family that on the outside looked quite busy and kind of, it looked qu- kind of quite, it was, it was always a very big, noisy house. My dad is Jewish, my mum isn't. And that was a big thing in my family because my dad was like disowned by his parents because it was an older generation. My, ha- my parents had me when they were in those days, in the 70s, a lot older than typical. They had me at 45. Um, and they disowned him. And I just remember from my earliest memories just being drummed into me, particularly by my mother, that like how bad religion is, because look what it does. It destroys families. They, they wouldn't speak to my dad again. So like, and I just heard this negative, negative connotation towards God, religion, that kind of thing. Um, and I still, I have a very difficult, I don't have a relationship with a religious being or, or, I don't have any connection with religion. I, I just don't have a sense of connection with it. I am really fortunate that I think at my rock bottom stage, when I was in that treatment center, I did get on my hands and knees for the first time ever and prayed to something. <clears throat> and that was for me, higher power. And for me, my connection to higher power is just, I just have something on my shoulder. Just, it's just something that I feel has my best intentions at heart. And that's kind of it for me. That's my, a sense of it's not a physical thing I can't visualize it I just know there is something that just wants me to kind of just do good and I believe that and it it seems to come true in my life um <clears throat> and that for me has been helpful because yeah the god part of coming into 12 step was really difficult for me I still find it hard I, I'll be truthful when I hear particular readings that have the word god in it a lot I find it really uncomfortable and really difficult. So anyway, I grew up in this big family. I grew up sort of hearing these stories about how my eldest sister didn't want me to be born. And it was essentially because she was embarrassed about my mum being pregnant at 45. Um, She hoped I'd come out mentally disabled. Um, And I remember hearing all these sort of jokes. It was like a joke in my family. But I internalized it and I didn't understand. I kind of, I wasn't protected by my parents from some of these conversations and stuff. So I just remember feeling like, am I somehow wrong? Am I weird? Am I different? Am I strange? Am I whatever? And I just, yeah, I remember that from earliest, my earliest ages, really, or my earliest time, really. So yeah, for me, I kind of grew up actually feeling really lonely, even though it was a very busy house, lots of people around all the time. I couldn't, I felt that so lonely and alone um I became really angry with my parents really angry um I set fire to my bedroom I became angry set fire to my bedroom I tried to genuinely electrocute my parents with their electric blanket I I was so angry with them so angry um but couldn't be angry I didn't know the word anger and even coming into treatment center for me all I would ever describe myself as was anxious. I'm anxious. I'm, I've got anxiety. I'm anxious, anxious. And they drummed into me like that's not a feeling. <clears throat> and I, I would say it's only 10 years ago that I started to be able to started to identify feelings. Am I angry? Am I lonely? Am I sad? Am I tired? Am I, and I'm just starting and it, it's taken 10 years and I sometimes still fall back into the trap of I just feel anxious. But actually... I've got much better identifying feelings now. Um, so yeah, I, I, what happened with me in relationships, and that's what I suppose the CODA stuff is about, is I would get obsessed by one person. Like at school, I would only ever have a best friend. I couldn't be in a friendship group. I found it too hard. I didn't want to share people. I wanted one person that was going to give me everything, like everything. Kind of, I used to describe it as like almost I would want a Siamese twin. I would want to be connected via umbilical cord or something into someone else. I, I, and even that somehow wouldn't feel enough. It was just like this overwhelming feeling like you've just got to be my life source and my oxygen and my everything I need from you. Inevitably, the relationship would end because I would, I now can see, I would be too overwhelming for them. It'd be too much. It'd be too intense. I'd be too needy, too demanding. And I can see that now, but at the time I couldn't because it's the only way I kind of understood. I was very immature with relationships and how to behave in, I didn't, 
I didn't really understand. I, I didn't have maturity to sort of know how to do it. So I would only ever have one best friend. Um, then when kind of the girl, you know, I started to get teenage and things, I was very scared of girls, but actually very attracted to girls. Um, and I would be again too demanding. I'd be a bit stalkery, a bit not, not in a weird, it wasn't too, well, I don't think it was too weird, but I would kind of, I would be a bit like just too much, too intense. And, and then when the relationship ended, because I've, I never ended in those relationships. Um, I would be absolutely broken, like like the ground's going to swallow me up. And that was my feeling, particularly until I came, really until I came into recovery, that like somehow if I'm not in a relationship with someone, I can only describe it as like I would like go up in a puff of smoke. I kind of would dis. I don't exist almost without being in a relationship with someone. I don't feel like that now. And that is where recovery has really come into me and, and 12 step code of recovery, but also other stuff. I've done like some other stuff, like something called survivors week, which is like a trauma program. Um, I've actually done some, a lot that I've done recently is somatic work, which is my body work, which for me has been amazing. Um, because for me, I've lived my life outside of my body. I've been too scared to feel the feelings and to be inside Paul. It's all been about getting the fixes, I suppose, mainly from people for me, externally. How can I get that inner young Paul, really, satisfied and soothed and okay? And it's all been about the external world for me. Um, so yeah, I would say for me, <clears throat> I would describe it, I would say for me, coming into recovery has given me, well, the one biggest thing it's given me is a pause button which is massive for me because everything for me before then was reactionary i would just like that like i would just react to a situation to a person something at work um decision making anything would just be so quick it would be instant without any consideration of the consequences of some of my actions and i've made some really bad decisions my thinking has got me into so much trouble and so much so many problems and so many financial issues and all sorts of things because I've been quick. I can, anyway, a pause button has been an amazing part of recovery for me. That has been fantastic. I just get that window of opportunity to pick up the phone, to speak to someone, to something that just gives me a bit of maybe a different slant on something. And that's been incredible for me. And I'd say the other part for me is I would, I would say before coming in, Dakota, I was probably 90% surviving life and 10% living it. I think now it's, it's not quite the other way around, but it's probably 70% living life, 30% survival. So it's massive, not massively gone the other way into, I feel like I'm actually living the life of Paul, um, where I wasn't before it was survival. And that, that, was a very different feeling and it 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 wasn't really wasn't comfortable um so yeah it's kind of um I, I think i've got a bit lost as well now or i don't know what else to say maybe i don't know there's loads more i could talk about but I kind of for me that's my yeah my codependent journey it's the steps i got i haven't actually completed the steps i got up to step nine and then the relationship didn't work out with my sponsor, but I have done the steps in another fellowship, relationship fellowship. Um, steps have been really important to me. I wouldn't say they've been, for me, like step four or five, I hear a lot of people talk about how like amazing it is for them and stuff. It, that wasn't my experience. My experience was every step actually was, had its own thing. I think it might have been because I've had a lot of therapy from like age 20 or whatever. I smoked a joint in Jamaica three days into a holiday and it absolutely sent me crazy, like psychotic crazy. Had to come back like on an emergency flight. And it, basically that was my kind of fit. It was like, that was where it was anxiety, anxiety. But um, why am I saying that? I am saying that, I don't actually know why I was saying that, but um, 
yeah, don't know why I was saying that bit. Um, let me just pause for a moment and think anything else I want to say. Steps, I was saying, yeah. So, oh yeah, because I've been in a lot of therapy. So since age 20, I've been in a lot of therapy. So kind of the step four, five thing, I kind of, I think maybe because I'd unraveled a lot of that stuff in therapy, it kind of, it wasn't such a thing for me, really. I'm not trying to put it down. It just, for me, it, what it, it's been every step that has its own thing. In a way, step one, two, I think are the most important. If I, I, I just need to always remind myself, particularly the powerless over other people, that is so significant for me, particularly like in work, I can still be really attached to wanting, feeling like I need to get my needs met from work, from bosses, from superior, like more senior people. And I want to impress. That's like a default for me. So I have to really remind myself. Another thing I mentioned actually earlier about perfectionism being a really core character defense of mine. You know what I try to practice now and I've been doing it for the last few years. I try to make at least one tiny mistake every day, even like putting a comma in the wrong place in, a, in an email or forgetting to put a capital letter or kind of just something really small every day just to remind myself I don't have to try to be perfect today. I don't have to try to set like that bar so high because it just creates such a uncomfortable feeling every day of, of stress, really, I suppose. So, yeah, I try to remind myself of that. Um, I think codependency for me is a lifelong thing. I never thought I'd want to go to meetings every week because when I was in the treatment centre, I learned all this new stuff and it's meetings every... I just thought, oh, my God, how am I going to... My life is so busy trying to manipulate other people or control other people or be in their lives. How am I gonna, even going to have time to go to a meeting? Um, cause yeah, manipulation of others is, a, is, was a big thing of mine. It's not anymore. Um, well, as in it comes in occasionally, but I'm, I have tools now. The toolkit bit has been really valuable to me of like just things that I can do. Doesn't stop it coming in. Doesn't stop the thoughts. Doesn't stop the whatever, but I now have things that just, again, with that pause button just lets me maybe process it a little bit. And hopefully I react in, or, you know, I, I, behave differently afterwards um i think that's probably it for me uh i can't really think of anything else to talk about hopefully that was in some way experience strength and hope on the step 10 bit my experience of it and my sort of journey in coda thank you everyone great thanks paul <clears throat> um Through my therapist, who does quite a lot of work in codependency, <coughs> he suggested this work, and um, it's called somatic experiencing or somatic work, and it is body work. Um, and I actually did it with a lady in the US um, on the West Coast. Um, <clears throat> and for me, it really connects with my codependency because for me, my codependency took me from such a young age having that trauma of for me of not feeling physically connected with my caregivers from a very young age i i felt like i in some way left my body <clears throat> or didn't want to be in my body so bringing me back into my body actually helps me feel spiritually connected that's for me the most connected i ever feel and it can now sometimes be for seconds or a few minutes or an hour or however long. But it's the for me at that moment, that's the most connected I feel to higher power, to spirituality is when I'm actually in my body. Otherwise, I'm actually out most of the I'm like a floaty head kind of walking around, not um, not really in myself. So I won't talk about what it actually is and stuff. I don't think that's probably probably appropriate for a coda meeting maybe um but you can look it up there's a lot of stuff on it um there's a couple of very well-known books on it um for me it really helps with my recovery because it connects me in a spiritual way to my kind of that's what i need hopefully that's helpful great thanks paul it's not something it's not like 
I learned to pause, as in it's not a technique I've been taught to do or anything. I think recovery has just naturally created a pause. So it somehow has just slowed me down slightly. It, everything has just slightly slowed down because everything was sped up and addicty and kind of now. And <clears throat> so that I don't think. I think it's just kind of created naturally from just doing the work in Coda. But yes, the, the, what it actually does is hopefully what it does, and it doesn't always work, but generally it, it is that before pressing send on that email that might be a rant or might be in a bit inappropriate or not quite right, or, you know, a bit too angry or, you know, it, it, it will, it generally means I won't press send or, if it's like, it probably is a lot to do with work. So it's like, if there's a meeting, if there's something and I want to kind of just say my thing and sometimes it's too much, it's too emotional or it's too kind of for the workplace or whatever, I just, I won't say it or I won't, whereas before it just would have like autopilot kind of come out. So that, yeah, that, that's the things that it allows me to do some of the couple of them but how it came about i think is just time and recovery for me but it's so valuable it's it's helped me so much get out of kind of i would get into just problems with people with relation you know kind of talks about functional and healthy relationships i would have pretty dysfunctional relationships a lot of it because i was just saying too much too quickly i was kind of just saying what was in my head um which isn't always so helpful okay thanks really good question because it's actually something i'm really proud of <clears throat> in myself but um <clears throat> my children are now 16 and 12 two boys <clears throat> um when they were very young baby and toddler and young i was really not present And really, it's because I hadn't learned in my childhood. I, I, and it's not a blame or excuse thing. It's just that it was the reality. I was not played with by, with my parents. So they didn't like get on the floor and play like cars going like moving around. Or there was no kind of actual play that I remember. And from speaking to my sisters, they kind of confirmed it. There just wasn't any. So I found it unbelievably uncomfortable to try and play with. I didn't know how to do it for starters. So it was like, I just didn't know what I was doing. And then if I tried to kind of fake it and like do it, I literally felt ill, like so uncomfortable. So I would make any excuse not to. I would like make that there was a work call. I would become the workaholic like my dad was really. That's kind of what I turned into, which was an avoidance thing. It was a way of avoiding being present with my kids so those young years were really unhealthy in my house my wife was in the prime of her addiction <clears throat> we were in a very unhealthy place as a couple my kids yeah I didn't I didn't do the stuff with them really I didn't however what I'm proud of through the reparenting I felt I've been able to do quite a bit of with myself, the young Paul and stuff and, and, and stuff. I feel I've made a living amends and I feel like I'm making it with them now even. <clears throat> and the last, it's not, it wasn't since, it wasn't immediately from coming into Code of Recovery, but it took a while, but I now have a really good relationship with them both and they have a good relationship with me and they even know, they're aware that I wasn't quite present in their young years and stuff. And we have a lovely relationship now. And I feel like I'm, I can actually say I'm proud. To, I'm, I think I'm a good father. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a tale of, of both ends. I've had through my growth in myself, I've been able to pass that back onto them. Great, thank you. <clears throat> I think, look, they're still there as in, they're not as powerful as they used to be. They're not as kind of damning as they used to be. I now have knowledge about them. So that helps kind of just understand them, I suppose, a bit more. Um, and when they come in, 
again use the pause but all those bits add up to me kind of being able to reconsider actually am i being controlling here or am i being manipulative or am i being perfection no am i <clears throat> yes no sort of thing if it's a yes where's it coming from is it like the young pool am i feeling like defensive and protective or i kind of i can sort of go through layers i suppose that's how it looks like in my head to try to get to where's it actually coming from where's that where's that ultimate end point which is i may be trying to manipulate my wife to do something my way is that where's it coming from is it coming from a place of fear probably fear that you know whatever anyway where's it coming from and i kind of go through i suppose the stages of is it my young self what age kind of do i feel like when i'm tr thinking about it so yes they all they come there i now have tools to try to process them sometimes it doesn't work sometimes i go from naught to 100 in half a second and it just goes back to the old way but a lot of the time it doesn't whereas before everything did <clears throat> whole life was lived like that now a lot of the time like i said sort of 70 percent maybe i'm able to kind of deal with it and it can feel really uncomfortable but i can deal with it in some way without wanting to feel like a, a I don't know, a, a, I'm not a therapist, so I kind of, I suppose I can't give like any therapy help, but <clears throat> something for me when I've kind of had a friendship, like especially early in recovery, because friendships really changed for me because some people got angry with me for kind of being in a treatment center for people. It brings up stuff in other people, I think. Um, recovery and stuff a lot of people, other people don't necessarily I don't know they feel threatened whatever but when I hear you talking that way about someone else's stuff and they're not really available when you know on the, uh, they're not they're not coming to you sort of proactively for me it reminds me of relationships I've had like that and what I've learned in CODA and it's probably a, it's it's because esteem has risen it's not to accept the like scraps it's called like not to accept the bottom of the whiskey bottle type you know the little the, the horribly bits or anything you know it's kind of you're worth more I'm worth more than that <clears throat> and if someone a relationship has to be balanced in my opinion not actually equal because there's no such thing I think but balanced and both part both sides need to get something out of it and for me I've had to let relationships go that haven't given that or have been too overwhelming. You know, someone has actually wanted too much of me. So for me, I've, I've learned that sort of, the, I need that balance. I can't, I have to look after myself and not receiving enough from someone in a non-codependent way or kind of someone being too demanding is not good for me. So I don't know, that's probably all I can say, I think from my experience. Yeah, they, I think the words you said as well is they've generally been material things which are still important in life. <clears throat> you know, you do need some things or not need, but you know, they can be valuable to have certain physical things. <clears throat> um, and it has been really hard to be honest. It's caused a lot of resentment and anger between my wife and myself. It did at the beginning particularly, but my wife got into recovery as well, which was initially really hard, but actually helpful in the end. Ultimately it's been helpful for our Fortunately, it's been helpful, but um, not that she had to get into it. I didn't. Anyway, um, for me, the loss bit is sad. I'm an, and I can feel it and I can grieve it sometimes. And like, you know, I was made bankrupt um, nearly seven years ago. It actually end, in the UK, it ends at seven years and that's in February for me. So that's a real milestone. I've really turned things around in my financial life since then. So I'm hoping to be able to purchase a house and things like that um when that expires in february so i've done a lot of work on that but and i don't want to lose that in a way that's kind of a a milestone and, and an important thing but the truth is it does hurt sometimes some of the things that i've you know when i do think about what some of the things i've lost but actually that's almost comes back to what i was saying before about feeling feelings and it's okay to feel sad sometimes or hurt about it or 
angry, whatever it might be, I, I it's permission to, I give myself permission to feel those feelings and I can't change it. It's one of those things. What's the point in, you know, kind of what's the point in regretting it or whatever. I can't change what's happened. I can learn from it and hopefully that's what I'm doing. But it's probably more than anything, it's acceptance that I can feel sad about it and that's okay. Paul, there is so many more questions I want to ask you, but our time has come to an end. The time really flew by really quickly here. Um, so we have our closing prayer and I'll unmute the room um, after we do the closing prayer, just so everyone can give your thanks to both Paul and Cammie. Um, it's been a long day for them. It's ended their day for them. And I know um, both of them were, were doing other acts of service uh, before, prior to this meeting as well. So we'll close off with our closing prayers and I also will give affirmations as well. We thank our higher power for all that we have received from this meeting. As we close, may we take with us the wisdom, love, acceptance, and hope of recovery. Thank everyone for being here, for investing in yourself. You're all a living legend. You're a magnificent being. You're a beautiful person. And I love all of you guys. Thank you so much.